Welcome to episode 65. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. Finally, warmer weather is here, and there is no better time than right now to book your vacation getaway with 3D Travel Company. Head on over to our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button on the left-hand side. They give a complimentary quote so you can get an idea of what it will cost to take your summer vacation. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Hurry and book today so you can travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey, you guys, this is a special shout out to all my listeners around the world. Who Did That Voice is now heard in over 78 different countries, and I can't thank you guys enough. Here in the USA and abroad, thank you for listening to Who Did That Voice. Keep listening and sharing with your friends. Hey, all you Marvel and Spider-Man fans out there. Who Did That Voice is doing an entire month with cast and crew from the 1994 Spider-Man the Animated Series, which aired on Fox Kids. You won't want to miss the month of June on Who Did That Voice. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show. You're listening to part two with Scott Cleverton, the voice of the insanomaniac Cletus Cassidy, a.k.a. Carnage, from the 1994 Spider-Man the Animated Series. What in the name of? It is my master, Dormammu, who confers this gift upon you, Cassidy. <laughs> gift? Remember, you wanted the same power that I offered Eddie Brock. This is it? <laughs> but to enjoy it, you must first swear to serve Dormammu forever. No problem, man. He sounds like my kind of guy. <laughs> Let me have the power. What do I do? This is a symbiote, a living organism. It must bond with you. And then I get to be like Brock? Similar, but different. As different as you are from Brock. Once you bond, it will reflect your hatred for humanity, your lust for destruction. I'll take it. It must take you. Come on. What are you waiting for? I am yours, man. <laughs> We're gonna wreak glorious carnage throughout the land. Carnage, eh? I like the sound of that. You promised us carnage. Deliverance. <laughs> Cassidy, what's wrong? Cassidy is gone. There is only carnage! War machine! He reacts to loud noise! I've got just the thing. A concentrated sonic disruptor blast. No! Whatever you do, don't stop! <laughs> Who are you? Your offspring. Offspring? Yes, yes! We recall replicating. Our flame-headed friend sent us to get this. Call us... Carnage! Carnage? There's another symbiote? Sorry to interrupt the reunion, we but... We hoped we'd run into you again. You know me? Cassidy! Think of the damage we can do now, man! <laughs> now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, you know, speaking of doing great voices, you know, I know you got to be a part of the Gargoyle show, and I believe that was your first venture into VO. Is that correct? That is correct. I was with ICM theatrically, which means they're supposed to get you jobs in movies and TV, right, yeah. as an actor, on camera actor. Um, that wasn't really working because it's one of those things, you know, like if, you're, if your dad asks a friend of his, you know, to give you a summer job, they never get around to giving you a summer job. It was <laughs> yeah. a little bit like that. Okay. But one day, my my agent, his secretary, a very nice lady called Mignon, called me up and said, "Hi, Scott. Um, I just wanted to know, can you do like an Irish accent? Because I hear you're Scottish." 
and that's kind of close. It's no, by the way. But <laughs> I said, yeah, of course. I said, because there's a voiceover down here in the voiceover department. Could you come in? Because they want to speak to you because they need a guy to do like an Irish accent. So I went in and they had a voiceover department. They had two little studios where they would record. Uh, they had two sound booths where they would re record the auditions in the morning. Okay. And I went in, I recorded it. They sent it off, sent it off. I got the job. I went in. And I'm working with the wonderful Keith David um, who, and Ed Asner and all of these extraordinary people who are very nice, having a great time. And Sheena Easton. And I played this character who became Ku Kalin, or Ku Cullen, depending on how you want to pronounce it, who basically transforms into this great Irish hero. So I was doing my sort of Dublin accent, which I'd learned doing a play some years before when I was at drama school. And I put some Gaelic into it, which is the only Gaelic I know. It's not Irish Gaelic, but it's it's Scots Gaelic, so which was Oma Krush Navush Noch Gege. Sounds great. <laughs> which actually means this man has extraordinary powers in Scots Gaelic. Wow. And the curious thing is Sheena Easton, apart from being a, a very well known and respectable recording artist, went to my drama school <laughs> in Scotland. Nice. Um, and that was, that was, that was it. And I went back and I did various different episodes with them on Gargoyles. It was a, a wonderful experience, great people to work with. Um, yeah, it, it was very different because you would go in and do the voices. There was no, there was no character. I didn't have a character sketch or anything. I had a rough idea of what they were supposed to sound like. The director's job is very often to explain exactly because you've not seen the script before. Yeah. Explain what's happened, what the context it is, where you are. It's really to fill in. So they're working in an imaginary world, and they're giving it to you. Okay. So very often, it's, I don't know if you've ever played a role-playing game. You ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. Okay. So it's very much you're all part of this sort of consensual imaginary space. Okay. You need to know what's going on, what's happened before, where you are, what you're seeing, what your relationship is, what you're trying to achieve, all these different things to give this line or whatever it might be. And it's very interesting because you're also, you're not working with headphones on because the, the trouble with headphones sometimes, um, and this may be different in other places in the world, but with headphones and when I was doing all my voiceovers in LA, you never use uh, headphones because what happens is you begin to start listening to your own voice. And as you're beginning to listen to your own voice, you begin sort of mutating your voice into what you want it to be. And it sort of becomes dishonest. Okay. That's one of the things that you hear. Sometimes when you hear people talking like this and they're doing commercials like that is they are turning their voice into the voiceover voice. Okay. So they're, they're beginning to sort of distort their voice and make it sound more voiceover. -y. Working on gargoyles and the Spider-Man, what you'll find is you'll find incredible natural, very naturalistic voices. Yeah, they did sound very natural. And a lot of the time you'll find that in, in commercials as well, like TV commercials. At that time in the 90s, the, the, the fashion was for incredibly natural voice production, you know. So, so people would go, you know, sometimes I just want to buy a soda. And I go to the store and I find all the sodas there. But, you know, I keep coming back to this, you know. Yeah. They would all come up with, you know, let me tell you something. They would all lead in with a very naturalistic kind of point of view. And with the voiceover world, obviously that's not carnage. Carnage is all, mm -hmm, I will destroy you, you know. So <laughs> yeah. So when it, you, ha yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're good. I was just going to say with, with Cletus Cassidy, when he became carnage, did they do some kind of alterations to the audio to make it more carnage -y, Or did you kind of do that vocally yourself or? No. Well, what you hear when I'm carnage is there's this kind of weird sort of reverby kind of distortion thing going on there. Okay. But no, uh, all that weird, bizarre cackling, that's me. <laughs> oh, cool. That's, that's absolutely me. And the thing with something like Carnage is, is that it goes from the very highest sort of shrieking um, cackling down into the sort of the most guttural kind of gravelly sort of thing you can go for. Yeah. You know, so it'll be like this and then it'll be all up. You know, so you're going through all of this thing down there, up and down. <laughs> and you know, by the end of the day, your voice is going to be wrecked. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is not, you don't, you're not performing Hamlet eight times a week. Okay. <laughs> and unless you got another job the next day, you're good. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, your voice will recover and everything will be fine. You won't be permanently dead. Well, at least me. I, I know what happened. <laughs> well, you know, we've talked about some awesome shows so far and, and just some wonderful background in VO and with David Tennant. Um, you know, a couple other great shows that you got to be a part of were the new Batman Adventures and Batman Beyond, which Batman Beyond for me was really epic because it was so futuristic and just out of this world awesome, I thought. And it was cool that I, you know, I was looking at up your career and I looked up that you played Jack Walker, who was Jack on the Royal Flush Gang in Batman mm-hmm. Beyond. And for you, what was it like to get to play a part in the Batman worlds? Well, you've got Kevin Conroy, right? This yeah. Batman. Who's? <laughs> I would just ca- I would just cast him as Batman. I think all the people who played Batman are basically they wish they sounded like him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He has the. I mean, because he's in all the video games, he did all of that sort of stuff, and he just has this casual elegance. I mean, you have Christian Bale, who's like, "Where are they?" You know, <laughs> everybody swear to me. You know, they're all doing this this thing, and his voice is Batman. Yeah. Also, and that was interesting because. Who was playing the king was George Lazenby. Oh wow! Who played James Bond in one outing and on her Her Majesty's Secret Service. That's awesome. And Amanda and Amanda Don Amanda Donahue, who was very well known in the 1990s and a very good actress, very very good actress. Um, she was on L.A. Law, so they went for that. Sort of, uh, George Lazenby is uh, Australian. She's English, and I think I was being English at the time. So they went for that. That sort of British sort of thing. It's interesting. Uh, One of the reasons that I left L.A. is I got tired of British people being consistently evil. (laughs) Is that we were always characterized as being evil. Now, if you want to ask me about my psychology, why I think that is, is I think there's a certain aspect of the British accent which makes, that can make Americans feel insecure about their intellectual capacity because we sound so clever. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily the case, but there is um, a, a, a certain aspect of all of those sorts of things. And, this, and, and those things have changed. I mean, you have Doctor Who, you have Benedict Cumberbatch, Sherlock. Um, it's become cool to be British. Right? And now more than ever before, it's the best time in history to be a young British actor or actress in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, that, that they are everywhere. When people say, <clears throat> should I go to L.A.? I go, well, look, British actors, you got Batman, you got Spider-Man, you got Daredevil, uh, you got Doctor Strange, and the list goes on. You got Ray from Star Wars. <laughs> exactly. You've got, um, Star Wars has always been sort of quasi-British. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's always been sort of up there. And then you've got the, the most, possibly one of the greatest voiceover performances in history, which is Mark Hamill as the Joker. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and and Mark Hamill as the Joker. Well, he he's channeling these aspects of the original Joker from the '60s TV show, but he's very uh, he's very kind of nineteen sort of pre nineteen fifties. Yeah, he has that sort of arch, almost English way of speaking uh, that you would find that you would expect to find in a film with Catherine Hepburn. You know, there's a sort of elegance and a kind of sort of rotundity and precision with everything that he says. And I, I would challenge any voiceover artist to listen to that and not go, <laughs> I take my hat off to you, buddy. That is exhausting, exhausting work. Well, you know, Mark Hamill was also in Spider-Man. He played Hobgoblin. That's right. I never, I, I never worked with him. I did, because we did have the, the same voiceover agent. Yeah, oh, wow, really? Um, and the way it used to work, now here's a little bit of inside baseball for you. Uh, I don't know what inside baseball is, but it's used in this particular way. Nice. So what would happen in ICM is they had two sound booths. And ICM prided themselves on having the best people doing what they did. They had people who made not very much money, uh, people like me, to people who made huge amounts of money, millions and millions and millions. People who would work from home and be driven everywhere. Wow. Okay. And people who were pulling in 12, 13, 14 million a year. Okay, wow. and they worked every single day that that there was. And what would happen in the morning is you would go in, and they would have a whole list of jobs that they needed voiceovers for. So you'd go in in the morning, and you would sit there with the most extraordinary group of people you've ever sat in a room with. So there would be the Mark Hamels, there would be um, what's his name? It escapes me. Hellboy, um, 
Ron Perlman. They'd be just extraordinary people. And you would go in, record the audition, or several auditions, and then get on with your day. They'd call you, you'd go do the job. That would be it. Sometimes what would happen is that happens sometimes on, certainly on cartoons, somebody would call you up. And they get, they say, Scott, I'm going to, I'm going to send you, um, I'm going to send you some sites. I'm going to call you in a little bit. Can you, can you read them down the phone to me? And you go, okay. So they would do that. They would audition you over the telephone. And Mark Hamill, I met him at one of the Christmas parties for ICM and he was a very nice man. But I have to tell you, most people in voiceover are, are pretty cool people. That's you awesome. Know, you know, I, I don't know what's your experience been of, of people who, in voiceover who you've spoken to over the course of your podcast. All of the ones I've spoken to have been extraordinarily kind and generous of their time and their gifts and their talents. And uh, I mean, the the community of voiceover itself has been the most friendly I've ever encountered in my life. Mm -hmm. You ever wondered why? Why? It's because we do everything in secret. <laughs> so it's like, well, okay. So explain. No, we're just, we're just, we're, we're, we're actually, we're very touched that, that what we've done in a darkened room in front of a microphone somewhere has, has actually, has actually meant something to people. Yeah. Because we do it and we're just part of a, a, a process. We, we are, we give our voices, th those voices inspire hopefully the animators to do some great work and eventually we'll see it, but we don't know when or how. Because it could release whenever you don't know, really, do you? No, of course, of course not. And it's different now with YouTube and streaming services and everything else like that. But you have to remember back in the day to try and find your episode of da 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 on a Saturday morning on TV. How would you begin to look for it? You wow. know, you couldn't do a web search. You know, there was nothing on Google. These things would appear. You know. And somebody would say, "Oh, I, I saw that thing." And you go, "Where? How?" And you go, "I can't remember." So, <laughs> a lot of the th a lot of the things that you would do would just, you know, you would do them and they would drift off into the ether. Um, wow. And so consequently, when people like you, Trent, are, are interested in what we've done and the stories behind what we do, uh, in general, this is not the norm. There's something sort of, I don't want to say heroic, but there's something quite demure about what we do. Um, and yeah. a lot of the time, what we're doing is we're concealing the way we actually sound. We're trying to sound like somebody else. Like if I'm trying to sound like you and McGregor or somebody else is trying to sound like Alec Guinness or somebody else is trying to sound like, a, you know, some evil space being who wants to destroy the world <laughs> <laughs> the way you do, you know, so that 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 would be why everybody is is genuinely sort of like flattered and enthusiastic about what you're doing. Well, and I never thought about it like that, you know, like just me in a dark room doing my thing and you know especially with the the way media and technology have advanced you know i can google this and look up that and back in the day you know there wasn't even internet and then there was and then it wasn't as you know sophisticated as it as it is today and so i could mm -hmm. i never really thought about that you know it's not like you could just say oh hey just look it up on youtube or just look it up on hulu or pull, pull it up on netflix and you know speaking of those services i wouldn't be where i am today to be able to relive some of my childhood dreams like i just finished watching on Hulu, the Spider-Man animated series from the 94 uh, era. And I wouldn't have been able to do that had Hulu not done that, you know? And so it's amazing because back in the day, it seemed like every time I turn a show on, I would see the same episode, no matter when it was, what year it was, what day it was, mm -hmm. it would be the same shows, same episodes every time. And so you wouldn't get to see everything in concession. And so that's why I love these services that do provide us the opportunity to, to go back and relive things. And now we can more specifically pinpoint, Hey, you were on episode such and such of season, such and such. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's amazing. It really is. One of, one of the, one of the most extraordinary things is, is that, you don't realize it at the time, but what, what you've done is going to keep going on and on. And my wife has made, you know, probably close to 100 movies. And it wasn't until uh, streaming services and everything else like that uh, that we sort of started rediscovering that her old films exist in places, you know. And it's a terrible thing to say, but there's, there's films that we found because somebody pirated them. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but the other thing that's happened is is that has really shown the uh, the industry the thirst that people have for product, and what it's made and what it's compelled them to do is to improve their product and actually put those things that people want on legitimate services that people will ultimately pay for. It, it's gone from being something that's that's uh, stolen to something which is bought and paid for, 
and and we see now with Netflix, Netflix is turning over a profit of billions, and it's investing it all, and is making great TV, great movies, and some Adam Sandler films. But on <laughs> on the whole, on the whole, it's it's really um, it's realizing that the best way to get people onto the service is because they want to watch Daredevil, or they want to watch House of Cards, um, or that they've got a new show that everybody's going to want to see, like the OA or whatever it might be. And I think it's just a matter of time before that is the way that we consume TV. Yeah. Um, I mean, I saw, I, saw, I watched uh, Legion the other day. I binge watched the whole thing. And all I could think of was, how did they put this on TV? Yeah. This is like, this is like, um, you know, Twin Peaks was pretty odd. This was odder. <laughs> You know, it was so non-linear, so um, incredibly fragmented, so wild in its leaps of logic and everything like that. And you go, wow, this is, this is effectively part of the X-Men universe. Wow, yeah. congratulations. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. But, but, but really, i got to be honest with you, the first time I saw, saw me doing Carnage was on YouTube. Oh, really? Well, how else could I see it? There's no box set. There's no, there was no, way, no other way of seeing it. Somebody said, oh, I found you doing content. Oh, really? Let me see. It's like, <laughs> wow, that, that's me. So when you ask me whether they did anything to my voice, well, they did, you know, they, they put some effects and stuff, but I, I saw it on, on YouTube. Yeah. And I wish they would do a box set for a lot of those old animated shows. Now that Marvel has been purchased by Disney, I hope eventually they will do that. So. Yeah, I think what's happened with the streaming services is now everybody has the box set. Technically, but if your internet goes down or your satellite signal's broken up and then you get a choppy show and then it's not worth watching if it's just, you know. It, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> that's true. You know, so, that's and that's, that's, one of the frust- yeah. that's one of the frustrations I have. Some nights I'm like, ah, I'm going to bed. This thing is jumping all over. It'll play two minutes and then it'll, you know, be, you know, uploading and then it'll play a few minutes and then upload. You know, it's like, okay, forget this. But uh, sometimes it's just nicer to have the discs on hand so you can pop them in and play them and no worries. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's, you know, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, speaking of discs, um, you were on Star Wars Episode One Jedi Power Battles on PlayStation 1 back when the old school CD games came out for the first time, actually. And um, that was a game I played the heck out of, and I thought it was awesome that you actually played Obi-Wan Kenobi on that game because I played that a lot. <laughs> well, I also, I'm, I'm also in the, the Phantom Menace game. That's fantastic. Um, which Which was a lot of, you know... I think we should go left. I think we should go right. I think we should go straight ahead. I think we should go back from where we came from. I don't, you know, there's there's a lot reams of and reams of person. Well, nothing compared to the the, the scripts that you have today. Um, if you look at the script of Grand Theft Auto Three, um, like well, Grand Theft Auto Vice City, you're probably talking about 150, 160 pages of dialogue. By the time you get into Grand Theft Auto 4, you're talking about over a thousand pages. In Grand Theft Auto 5, I can't even begin to consider uh, how many pages of dialogue, <laughs> contextual dialogue, wow. and really brilliantly done dialogue. I mean, just just stunning. And it's absolutely. I mean, you're talking about me doing something like those games, which might take a couple of days. For those guys, something like that, or something like Red Dead Redemption, or one of those AAA titles, you're talking about weeks. Weeks and weeks and weeks in the sound booth. So to be on the the sort of cutting edge of, of doing something like that, I, I mean, I can't I can't begin to imagine what it's like. It's probably like like doing a book on tape. I only ever did one, but it's probably the hardest job I ever had to do in voiceover. Wow! Uh, because because it's you in front of a microphone reading a book all day. Yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine that's pretty hard from uh, some of the people I've spoken to that that's their whole career. I, I don't think I could honestly do it. <laughs> what, did they, what did they tell you about the toughest thing? Well, I mean, they say, you know, you spend on average 13 to 20 hours on a read and then you spend 13 to 20 hours editing. And I mean, you're like the whole production team. You do it all. And that's just seems like a lot of work for, you know, what I've come to understand is not the greatest compensation for the effort that they have to put in for it. So. No, well, I mean, I, I did it. I didn't have to do any of the production stuff. It was just me uh, sweating in front of a microphone for eight hours a day. And it's the sort of thing that if you have to do a lot, you have to you have to have time off because your your voice gets very very tired because um, you're talking nonstop for hours on end. Yeah, and it's 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 quite 
it's quite brutal in, in, in that sense. And yeah, it's, you don't get paid that much money to do a book on tape. But you know, the other thing is, and I think it's changing now, but, but doing video games um, is not the most lucrative of um, jobs to do. Um, because you're not, it, it doesn't work like um, TV shows like Gargoyles or uh, Batman or Spider-Man or any of those things. Those that you are paid as if you were an on-camera performer, which means you get, um, you know, you get residuals. Yeah. Okay. You're paid a fee. If you do more than one voice, if you do more than two or three voices, you get another fee, et cetera, et cetera. And you get residuals. I still get residuals today from, from the work I did back in the nineties. I mean, it's comical. I live in Spain. How am I going to cash a check for, you know, 49 cents, but <laughs> I get them, which is nice to know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things with, with SAG-AFTRA is that they were, they were going to, they were going to fight for a better deal for voiceover artists um, and in the video game sphere. There's a lot of people who do a lot of good work and they you know, and I'm sure their fee is considerably higher. There's a lot of people who are coming in and sort of name recognition, whether it's Kevin Spacey or various other people who come in to do video games. Um, one of the greatest guys to do it was uh, Vin Diesel. His, he runs the, uh, he, has, <laughs> he has the strange reputation of his, his video game of the, um, oh, what's it called? The science fiction movie, The Chronicles of Riddick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the Escape from Butcher Bay, uh, the the video game is actually better than than the last movie he made on the subject. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I haven't well, actually played it, but that's funny to know. Well, Vin Diesel is a big gamer, and he's a big role playing guy. I mean, he still runs a game of D and D, apparently. Oh wow! Um, and you see that sort of influence all over the place. Um, but anyway, to, back to not being paid too much. Yeah, a book on tape is 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 a lot of work with not a great deal of money. Although it's it's nice to have done something at least at that moment relatively definitive. And the video game thing is that they're they're still fighting for that. That was back twenty years ago that people were still going. Hang on a second, they're just paying us to do this and nothing else. And you talk, you're talking about something like the Phantom Menace, which sold ten million units or something like that. Holy cow! You're kind of like, oh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, and no residuals from that, unfortunately, either. No, resid no residuals whatsoever. Yeah, which is sad. You know, speaking of all these wonderful VO projects, you know, one of the things I learned, Scott, was uh, a lot of VO actors, you know, kind of helped me understand that before you can get into VO and before most people even considered or think about it, they are actors first and foremost before they're voice actors. And, mm -hmm. and speaking of that, I know you got to play on the show Borgia uh, from 2011 to 2014. Uh, and that mm -hmm. was the one that starred, um, I'm thinking, uh, John Duman, I believe. Yep, that's him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my wife absolutely loved that show, and she got me sucked into it. And I know you got to be a part of that in five different episodes as Gonzala Fernandez de Cordoba or Cordova. And um, what was that like for you to get to be a part of that franchise? Um, that was great. Well, first of all, my, my wife was already in it. She's in virtually every single episode. She played Vanozza, who's the, the lover and concubine of the Pope. Oh, you know? yes, hey. yes, yes. Hey, it was the 16th century. Every Pope's going to have a concubine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so she, she was in there playing that sort of matriarchal role. Wow. And I, I had been involved in the casting of it. I worked with the casting director here in Spain, and we, there was a lot of uh, young Spanish actors who ended up being in the show because of it, which is peculiar because effectively um, the character of um, the Pope at that time is Rodrigo. He's a Spanish guy, and there's a lot of the characters who are effectively Spanish. Yeah. Um, but there was no Spanish co-production, and none of it was shot in Spain. It was all shot between m most of it in Prague and the Czech Republic, and some parts of it were shot in Italy. And it was it was great. It was the it was the most expensive TV independent TV show made in European history. Wow! Really? Um, each season cost probably in the region of thirty five million euros. Oh wow! But you know that sounds like a lot of money. But then you look at something like The Crown, which cost one hundred twenty one hundred ten million dollars yeah. for one season. Or you're looking at Game of Thrones. I can't even begin to imagine how much that costs. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I know my wife and I got sucked into it, and then she told me it was ending or wasn't. It was already over uh, because she just discovered it this last year, and I was like mm. so depressed because I was like it was done so well, 
And uh, the stories were riveting and like, it was kind of like you left on a cliffhanger every episode and wanted to know what's coming next because it's just that good, no matter what the stories were about. So, Well, the guy, the guy who created it, um, Tom Fontana, um, is from New York and he's been a showrunner, it seems like, all his life. He was the showrunner on the TV show Oz, which was on HBO. Oh, yeah. He had another show recently called Copper. And he's one of those guys who really does it. And his idea was always to do three seasons. Okay. He, want, he wanted to be loyal to the history of it and follow the, 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 the three-season arc of it. Okay. Where he made the, the, the first season was about the Pope. The second season was about um, Lucrezia. And the last season was about Cesare. Um, that, was, that was the kind of thematic things that he wanted to put in those three. And it was shot with the highest production values possible. The crews were incredibly professional, world class. And we had actors, there was 22 different nationalities. Holy cow. Wow. Um, they were from everywhere, but we shot everything in English, curiously enough. And it's funny, when you're shooting something, a period piece, where there's 22 nationalities, the most alien accent is the American accent. <laughs> I bet. Uh, because it's, it's the only contemporary accent. We can establish that the American accent really is native to America, and it's only in the last couple of hundred years. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit like, um, you know, in, in, in Lord of the Rings, it would be very grating if somebody spoke with an American accent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, we need something which implies age. So the interesting thing in that show is I'm playing Gonzalo Fernández de Córdoba, the, the great uh, general of the Spanish armies. Now, the Spanish armies at that time, it was a little, it was a little bit like being in the modern day the the head of the armed forces okay you know, in, in the united states you had the biggest toughest baddest military force in the history of the planet and that's what the spanish were so i was my my point of view of doing that is i was a war machine i was a tank i was you know unstoppable and unkillable and that's a kind of curious thing and quite difficult to play because you are an unstoppable force, and then you have to interact with the Pope, who's also an unstoppable force. Um, so that kind of makes things rather tricky, because you, you sort of have to act from the point of view of kind of being inhuman. Uh, now, the Pope has allowed his frailty because as his old backstory, but really what I was representing was the, the armed military might of an entire nation that, that had managed to conquer most of the world, and now it, was, it happened to be in the process of conquering the Americas at that stage as well. But um, everything was uh, extraordinary, from hair, makeup, costume. Um, I mean, armor looks cool. I recommend you don't wear it for more than a couple of hours at a time <laughs> because it becomes very, very painful. Um, also, don't try to sneak up on anybody wearing armor. They will hear you. Um, <laughs> all, it's just clunk, clunk. It's true. You're like clunk, clunk, clunk. No, no, no. There's, there's no stealth available when you're wearing plate armor. Yeah. <laughs> And it's one of those things that you get to do occasionally as an actor. You get to be an armor, be on a horse. And for that little moment, it's the 16th century. You get to feel what it was like. You get to, you know, experience that moment in the present day. Those are the cool things about being an actor sometimes. It was the same thing when I was working in the Ukraine doing Sharp's Rifle, which was uh, a story about the, the independence war when the, uh, the British were attempting to help the Spanish to liberate themselves from the French. And we did that with Sean Bean, and uh, there was Brian Cox, and, uh, you know, Daniel Craig was in it. It was, uh, you know, it was one of those TV shows that every British actor eventually did. Pete Postlethwaite. I don't know if you know Pete Postlethwaite. He was in Jurassic, he was in the second Jurassic Park. He was nominated for an Oscar for In the Name of the Father. Magnificent man awesome actor uh, if you saw him you'd go oh yes i know who he is <laughs> so it was it was one of those experiences and being dressed in a british lieutenant's uniform of 1812 i think it was and being out there in the wilderness on a horse it's pretty authentic <laughs> it's really it's really what you know i understand what people who do battle reenactments you know or people who are into larping you know larping right yeah mm -hmm. okay I'm not going to ask you any more about that in case you've done it. Um, <laughs> well, that's fine. I'm, I'm not judging. 
No, it's okay. No, well, as far as history goes, it's always been one of my absolute favorite things, especially when I studied it in school, you know, for college and high school. Um, so being a part of those historical shows is just, it's super fascinating to me. And my wife is a huge fan as well as, as myself of the, the Borgia show. So I just had to talk with you about that. I have two final questions for you today, Scott, yeah. and I will let go you ahead. go. The first one is, tell me a little bit about the Ethics and Film Training Foundation that you have. Right. Well, in 1999, my wife, Asun Pesarna, she wrote a book called El Trabajo del Actor del Cine, which means the work of the film actor. And she, after working in film for 20 years, decided to sit down and try and explain what she did and what her process was. Yeah. Uh, because she'd played so many leads that she actually had a methodology to approaching playing a leading actor in a movie, which nobody really talks about because the people who do it don't sit down and try and explain it to anybody else. It's a rather rarefied pursuit. It's like teaching somebody how to uh, fly a stealth bomber. You know what I mean? How many people are going to find that book interesting? You know, they might find it interesting, but how many people are going to be able to apply it? Yeah. Than anything else. So from that, she was asked to teach um, a class, a master class, and I joined in. And because I'd had my revelations about film acting and how it worked and everything else. And then from that, from that point, at the start of the 21st century, we started teaching short, intensive workshops and classes. And eventually that got to the stage where we were touring around Spain. We went to Portugal and we would teach an intensive course over, uh, over a week. In 2005, we decided to let's extend that training, and we created our foundation. Our foundation is called First Team. Nice. First Team comes from an expression in filmmaking, particularly filmmaking in the United States, well, only in the United States, where the second team are the 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 light doubles, okay, the stand-ins, and the first team are the principal actors. So what they'll do is they'll go second team out, first team in, okay, which. We're in Spain. I've repented and I've regretted calling it first team from day one because I'm like, nobody can say first team. <laughs> I spend all day spelling it to people in Spanish. I should have called it something simple. But anyway, it's called first team. And that's what it's been called for over 10 years now. And we started teaching longer courses and we got to the stage where we associated ourselves with a university and we taught a postgraduate course. The first, I believe, postgraduate course in film acting in the world. Wow. And we taught it at the university level. And that would, well, it was a very long piece of training. It was about 1,500 hours. And we would always work with, with cameras and we would culminate in, in shooting um, five or six short films with everybody. But our film training, we are always working on camera. Um, we work in Spanish predominantly. Um, and since we started, I've taught around, we have both taught around 11,000 hours. Good Lord. And in 2007, about 10 years ago, we were uh, we got a grant to do our training else, uh, elsewhere in South America from the Spanish government. So we taught in Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, and in Costa Rica. Oh, wow. Um, all in Spanish, which is interesting from a guy from Scotland going to Argentina and <laughs> speaking my version of Spanish, which is even stranger. So there we taught in, we taught in Buenos Aires, Mendoza, Córdoba, Rosario, La Plata. In Bolivia, we taught in the capital, La Paz, and in Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bogota in Colombia, and in San Jose in, in, uh, in Costa Rica. And as they always say, nobody is a prophet in their own land. It was always great fun, and we uh, made a ton of friends and inspired a lot of people to go on and work in film, not just as actors, but um, a lot of people went on to actually shoot the movies that they worked with us uh, for the first time in public. They actually went on to actually shoot and finish and edit and distribute their films. Oh, wow. So we, we, we had a great time doing that, of course. Then the, Spanish, then the uh, financial crisis arrived, which put an end to all of that, which is delightful. But we continued to work, and we published our first book recently about the first uh, female film directors in Spain we have a presentation of that book this week and we continue to uh, teach and train i work as a coach in movies uh, at time i spent three and a half months at the end of last year on a tv show called in english it's called queens which was about elizabeth the first and mary queen of scots yes which was all sh which was all shot in english and very interesting because i had to convert spanish people into scottish people <laughs> wow fantastic 
which is pretty pretty rough. Uh, yeah. But it was a good experience for everybody all around. And this year we've started. Uh, sometimes my wife she just finished playing the lead in a movie uh, where she plays a, a real character from a real story who was a nun in the end of the Second World War, helped rescue thousands of people from uh, camps in the south of France called the the the, the train of liberty the train and of i've liberty. just okay. done yeah i've just done two tv things back to back one is called the ministry of time which is a great spanish tv show which uh an american network actually ripped off and they're currently in a lawsuit with them they completely stole it uh, you know and i spoke to the director i said did they really steal it I said yeah they were here on set i gave them the scripts <laughs> wow goodness Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, they, yeah, they got they got the, they got the script, they got the Bible of this of the of the entire show. If wow. they say they didn't store it, they're just you know they're fibbing. And so yeah, so I'm in the position now where I get I get to teach, I get to act, I get to do all that sort of thing, and I do I do voiceovers here. I do a lot of uh, voiceovers in English, you know, whether it's ads or what would be the word corporative stuff there you go i can't yeah no it's okay speak english now um <laughs> and every once in a while the odd bit of animation but but there's not the uh the just the sheer quantity of stuff that you'll find in, either in los angeles or new york or toronto or vancouver um it's a it's a very sort of different uh style of working which is peculiar in many ways because hypothetically now with the internet it should be easier than ever to to, to be able to work from wherever. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, but so, so that, that's the story with the foundation. The reason it's a foundation is we wanted to basically have a very clear mission statement, which is to dignify and professionalize the job of the actor in all the current mediums and future emerging mediums um, to basically instill a sense of ethics, uh, professionalism, and really dignify what we do is a job because I think what we do as actors is an important job. It's not frivolous. Um, it's a very important social service that we actually uh, contribute to the world at large. We're there to entertain, illuminate and give some people, um, you know, let people have fun and dream a little bit. It's incredibly privileged and we should take what we do, seriously but just not take ourselves too seriously <laughs> absolutely scott well the last and final question i have for you today is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind hmm. that's a good one thank you um the leg the legacy no no that's a very good one because um a lot of the time when people are dissatisfied with what they're doing it's because they really feel that they're not making a difference yeah and i think just in the same way that you you're creating right now in your own podcast, you're creating a, a legacy. You're creating something that will become a point of reference. Uh, it'll be, and I think that's the, the, the magnificent thing with podcasts is that it has allowed everybody to really do in-depth investigations, conversations, interviews about the things that we all love, or at least some of us love. I've heard the greatest interviews imaginable on, on podcasts, whether it's the Nerdist, whether it's on um, the Treatment, the KCRW podcast, on Fresh Air with um, Terry Gross. Um, I think all of us who, are, who love podcasts all have something in common, which is, well, we're really seeing inside something. We're really seeing, to use the term again, the inside baseball of it all. Yeah. Uh, it's like Adam Carolla. I used to listen to Adam Carolla when on the radio in LA on uh, on K Rock, and then I discovered probably I don't know six years ago he had his own podcast. And I think he's a brilliant broadcaster, and um, what he does is magnificent. And I see what he's done within the podcast community is that he has inspired a lot of people to do it and helped a lot of people to do it. You know, he's gone on their shows. People have listened to their show because they want to hear Adam Carolla, and people have subscribed to those shows and gone on to listen to them. And he has a great legacy in that sense. In terms of my legacy, what I want to do is I want to make sure that people are doing things for the right reasons. I want people to approach the job that we do with professionalism, that we learn that we need to treat each other really well. We need to respect each other and our jobs. 
And we really need to get back those things that we've lost with this great democratization of digital filmmaking, which is the absolute professionality of all the different departments who are part of the process of putting together a, a TV show or a movie or, or anything else like that. And if there's anything else, I want, I want people to realize that uh, this is not based on faith. This is based on uh, very simple ethical and scientific principles of what we do, of how acting works, and how acting works within the context of the filmmaking team. There you go. Well, Scott, thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Would you please just give us a closeout as Carnage from Spider-Man the Animated Series? <laughs> this is Carnage asking you to subscribe to this podcast. Who did that voice? <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate your time, brother. That's, that's great. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And I, I wish you all the best. And I should be listening to not only past, but future episodes. Uh... Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's episode with Scott Cleverton, the voice of Cletus Cassidy, a.k.a. Carnage. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice. I would love to hear from you. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us this Friday for our next special guest, Gary Imhoff, the voice of Harry Osborn, a.k.a. Green Goblin 2. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself, who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice. <laughs>